Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the library. I'm Troy Swanson, library department chair. I want to thank you all for coming, and thank you faculty members who have classes here today. Um, today we continue our conversations about World War Z and about uh, some of the themes around World War Z. And you know World War Z is a zombie apocalypse novel. Um, but we're not talking about zombies today. We're doing something actually a little bit more serious, significantly more serious. Uh, we're going to talk about um, suicide and some of the research in medicine, uh, medical thinking behind that. You know, the reason we wanted to do this is so often we hear when people talk about the zombie apocalypse, um, they say, I wouldn't even, you know, I would just, you know, end it. Like, that's a whole conversation, right? In the zombie apocalypse, would you survive? Would you kill yourself? What's the value of life and that kind of thing? And, and all year we've talked about these issues, and I feel like at some points, you know, it gets a little abstract, and we've been kind of offhand with a very serious topic. So we wanted to take an a, uh, event today to make it a little bit more serious and, and do justice to something that is very um, significant. With that being said, I want to point out Teresa and Linda in the back. They're waving. They're from Moraine's um, counseling department. Obviously, this is a, a topic that may touch people in personal kinds of ways. Um, and if you feel the need to talk to somebody now during the event or afterwards, remember that we have folks here on hand and our counseling department um, always has someone on hand um, over in the S building. And they're really excellent people. And I just want to remind you that that service um, exists. So with that being said, all of that preamble, let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Jason Burns. Um, I realize, yes, I realize that um, I've known Jason for about 20 years. We've grown up together. And I'm always amazed and impressed at all of his endeavors in life. And he's a valued friend. And the lesson here is to find smart friends and take advantage of them when they will speak for free for you. <laughs> so thank you, Jason. So with, let me do um, a formal introduction. Uh, Jason Burns um, earned his Bachelor's of Science in Psychology at the University of Iowa. Um, his MD at the Carver College of Medicine at the University of Iowa. He's complete, completing his residency and transitioning to fellowship at Medical College Wisconsin, Children's, Hospi uh, Children's Hospital Wisconsin, both in Milwaukee. Additionally, uh, he's a house staff physician at Milwaukee County Behavioral Health Division in their Psychiatric Crisis Service. And if I missed, messed up anything, you can correct me. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jason. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Swanson, also known as Troy to me. So um, all that information was indeed accurate. And so I'm here to talk about suicide. And, and I think what I'd like to do, because the whole thing starts with this idea of um, a kind of rational suicide, right? The idea that in this apocalypse situation, people would just say, too much for me. I have no chance for a quality of life. I'm done. And that's a popular idea, and it changes across cultures, and it's kind of intellectually interesting. So I'd like to kind of start at that point and then move through some of the ethical issues, move through some of the science around suicide, and then just get to um, kind of what I do day to day, which Troy mentioned the uh, Psychiatric Crisis Service, which I spent a fair amount of time there. That's the psychiatric emergency room in Milwaukee County. Um, we see several thousand patients a year, most of them in a psychiatric crisis, often involving um, suicide attempts, suicidal thoughts, so other things as well, but uh, a common issue to bring you to a crisis service. So I'm going to start off actually playing, it's not World War Z, the, the uh, film or the book, but it's my favorite zombie uh, world, which is, uh-oh. The uh, Walking Dead here. Okay. So for those of you who aren't familiar, that's Dr. Edwin Jenner, the character on the show there. Um, and the gist you just saw, he, he destroyed his only good uh, specimen from this uh, zombie outbreak. He's working at the CDC by himself. He's the only one left. So basically the disclosures are, I don't have any, no conflicts here. I'm not going to sell you anything. Um, we're going to kind of break this, this idea of suicide down into a few uh, categories. So first we'll just talk about, talk about the act of suicide itself. 
And to do that, we need to define it. So this is the CDC's definition. Death caused by self-inflicted injurious behavior with any intent to die as a result of the behavior. So the, the key things are a suicide is a death that is caused by an intended action. Um, what it's not is an accident. You know, we don't count those. And, and in, from a public health standpoint, we probably underestimate rates of suicide because we don't know sometimes. People are found <laughs> dead. And we don't know exactly the circumstances. Uh, we try to infer things. So whatever numbers you hear are probably low um, in general because we don't, we, we don't count accidents. Um, <clears throat> anybody else have other ideas about what a suicide is or other definitions? Something popped to mind? I think it's a pretty succinct one. Uh, it works. I just referenced some related issues here. Um, suicidal ideation is just any kind of thinking about suicide. Um, it's typically what leads to the act itself. Then suicide attempts are obviously are, we don't want to call them failed suicides. We're talking about somebody who had attempted to commit suicide and didn't die. Um, the language around that can be kind of complicated. We don't want it to sound like it's a failure. In, in a way, it's a success, right? You've survived. Um, and there's this idea of self-injurious behavior, which is related in some, it's actually a risk factor. We'll talk about that later. But self-injurious behavior is doing something to oneself to cause harm without the intention of killing oneself. The most common thing that we see in mental health is a cutting behavior, um, where someone might make superficial cuts on themselves with the idea that that might re relieve some kind of intense emotional pain. Or the opposite, sometimes people feel empty or hollow and they want to feel something to consolidate a feeling. And assisted suicide, of course, is the idea that someone who can, can't or won't actually uh, commit suicide tries to get someone else to help them do that. And most commonly we hear about that being a professional, like a physician. So how common is suicide? It's the tenth leading cause of death in the United States. Pretty common. Um, and it has been pretty consistently, 10 or 11, almost all the time. Um, 40,000 deaths as far as a raw number. Our suicide rate is about 10 per 100,000 per year. Um, and that is pretty well in the middle if you look at countries. So this is actually culturally dependent. And uh, there's a fair amount of variation. So right now, the most recent data show that... Um, Japan and Korea are kind of at the top of the chart as far as their rates. They're in the 20s, 20 to 25 per 100,000, so quite a bit more, about twice the rate. Um, and then about half the rate of us is Great Britain, which is the lowest rate, which is about 5 per 100,000. So that's pretty variable. And it really does, it depends on the cultural attitudes towards this. Um, it does seem to have a big effect. The largest number I've ever seen was Russia in the 1990s. Uh, was as high as 40 per uh, 100,000, um, where you had a, the confluence of cultural attitudes that were a little bit more normative towards suicide and a great stressor of the, the change of the regime and the poverty that went with that, and, and uh, a huge drinking culture, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, across the board, it, it varies, again, by culture, how much this uh, gender disparity, like the degree of gender disparity, but across the board in every culture that I know of, men commit suicide, actually die uh, by suicide more than women. In the United States, it's about four times as much. Um, I've seen as high as six or ten in other countries, but it, it's, um, it's kind of a known thing. One thing that you may see, I know we have people from nursing courses here, right, probably some psychology students, there is this uh, idea that women in the United States do actually attempt suicide a bit more than men, uh, which is true, but completed suicides are greater as a proportion in men. Um, and that has to do with what we'll talk about soon, the means that people select to attempt. So can you, I don't know if you can see this really well. So this is breaking down suicide by age. So I would guess that most people in this room fall in this category, age 15 to 24, 25 to 34, or maybe we have some of us like me in the 35 to 44 group. Um, 
in these groups, so I said it's 10th overall, but in these, these younger groups, and 15 to 24 is what I would call brain adolescence. This is when there are some neurologic uh, neuroanatomy set up. The way the brain functions is that of an adolescent. And in that age group, number two is homicide, number three is suicide, as far as the first one is accidental always with these young people. But two and three, interestingly, in that 15 to 24 group, uh, homicide and suicide, you're about as likely to be killed by somebody else as you are to, be, to kill yourself in that group. And those numbers are actually pretty big. When your overall deaths are in the, you know, like tens of thousands and you've got 4,600 suicides, it's a big number in this group. So it's a, it's a high-risk group. Um, we see that, though, there, these numbers, there's still a lot of people as they go along. It's not just young people. But as far as a proportion, you know, young people generally aren't dying of disease. Um, and so this is a big chunk of deaths and potentially one that's modifiable. So we talked about the means, and I, I talked about that gender difference. And this is really where it's at. In the United States, now this changes again by country, huge proportion of people who are dying by suicide are dying by firearms, because we have a lot of firearms. And men, by and large, use firearms a heck of a lot more than women. And so um, I have taken, certainly taken care of people who have attempted suicide with a gun and survived, but there aren't very many. It tends to be pretty definitive. Um, so that, that's a highly lethal means. Poisoning, uh, in that poisoning counts, you know, medication overdose, prescription medication overdose. Um, really common. It's the number one way that women attempt suicide. But percentage-wise, not quite as lethal. So lots and lots of temp folks attempt this way. It's the second most common, or third most common, um, in the United States way to complete, but it's the most common way to try. And then suffocation, which includes hanging uh, and uh, asphyxiation. And then there's a whole bunch of other ways. You know, probably the next most common would be uh, jumping from a height. So that's kind of the basics, the numbers, who does it, how, how often it happens, what are the means. Um, so one interesting question, I think, from an intellectual standpoint, we have this idea, you know, a big theme that comes up in this, this sort of zombie uh, book and film culture is, you know, are these people, are these former people still people? Are these zombies humans? And it's interesting to me with suicide, is that a human thing? Because most diseases that occur in humans, especially in, in mammals, we see similar diseases. Um, when we look at suicide, we see some behaviors. There definitely are lots of stories of animals who appear to be ending their lives. So there are examples of cliff jumping. Um, there's a famous example of this dog in Newfoundland who reportedly kept attempting to drown himself. And the owner would rescue the dog. And the dog seemed, seemed depressed. Um, over a period of weeks, eventually the dog did drown itself. Um, and there are similar stories in mostly mammals. Um, we've all heard of beaching whales or these uh, examples of starvation. Uh, bee aphids do this interesting thing when they're threatened where they'll like explode and, uh, and sacrifice themselves to protect the rest of the, the folks, uh, the other bee aphids. Yeah. So we see these behaviors, but there's not a lot of research on this. And I think the main reason is how do you measure intent in an animal? How do you know that they did this on purpose? Did they make a plan? You know, did they say, today's the day, like Dr. Jenner said, I think I might blow my brains out tomorrow. Does, does an animal say that? And how the heck would we get at that? We do have animal models for, for things like depression, anxiety, PTSD, uh, ADHD. So we've bred animal models for that, but there doesn't exist an animal model for suicide. We've never been predictably able to make animals do this. I'm not actually aware of any lab animals that have uh, these, these stories that I'm telling you about are more from popular kind of anecdotal things. So in human studies, there have been all kinds of, there's tons of research. If you want to go into research, you want to go on uh, after your time here and get into research, uh, 
you can find money in suicide research because it's a scary thing uh, and uh, it's not well understood. So there's been a ton. There'll be a ton more. Some of the things that have come up are receptors. So these serotonin receptors being abnormal. Um, the actual level of serotonin metabolites, this 5-HIAA, um, has been shown in post-mortem studies of people who committed suicide and actually post-mortem studies of people who are just generally aggressive seem to have low levels of this. Um, and then when there are structural and, and functional studies like uh, functional fMRI and structural neuroanatomy studies, um, there have been implicated regions, the superior temporal gyrus, the left anterior sing cingulate gyrus, the right perihippocampal, prefrontal cortex, lots of white matter problems with the limbic system projecting into the cortex. So for somebody who's not a neuroanatomist, it's probably a, lot of, a bunch of gobbledygook, right? Like it's just a bunch of words. And I put it up there just because I want you to see this is just me culling the literature down to put on one slide, and it's pretty all over the map. There's, there's stuff. There, are, there have been areas and processes identified, but it's not any cohesive thing. It's not like there's a suicide structure in the brain, or there's one chemical or one receptor that you can identify. Um, the only common trend I would tell you is that these areas are essentially all in the neocortex. So there does seem to be something human about the idea of suicide. There, something about assessing the situation, making a plan, you know, uh, seeing suicide as a means to solve a problem, and that's a neocortical process. So um, in this, this slide here, okay, so I don't have a pointer. Um, you, some of you may be familiar with these kind of divisions. These are evolutionarily older parts of our brain as we kind of come through here. And really all, all this stuff, this neocortex, is much, much more developed in human beings than it is in other animals. Uh, and it probably is what makes us human. So when I kind of gave you that slide before, most of the processes are happening in various regions of the neocortex. And there seems to be some problem with a mismatch in communication because it's not like these are independent organs, like this is a kidney and this is a heart. This is an interconnected neural system, and there seem to be problems in communications among these systems. But we don't really understand it very well. And to be fair, we don't understand it very well for a lot of mental illnesses, not just this idea of suicide. So it all kind of boils down to intent. Making a plan, going through with it. So I kind of, this uh, Durkheim described kind of versions or variations of uh, suicide. And one of them is the egoistic suicide. So it's this idea that people who commit suicide um, might fall into categories. And one of these categories is this egoistic category where someone feels sort of alien. They feel like they don't fit in society. They don't match up with a group. They feel isolated. But they do it in a sort of, in a core way. Like, I am different. And uh, the, the example of this is people uh, with schizophrenia who commit suicide often feel that way. That they are markedly different from the rest of the world, detached in some way, and um, eventually commit suicide. There's this idea of the altruistic suicide that everybody's going to be better off if I'm gone, right? If there's just, I'm just a kind of drag on everyone. If I just get rid of myself, then, then everything will be better. I'm doing it for someone else. And then there's this anomic, which is the largest group in, in this Durkheim classification, which is somebody who felt connected at one time. And then there's something that disrupts that. It's a divorce. It's a loss. Um, something fundamentally changes in their life and they feel now isolated and out and not worth living, that kind of thing. There might even be some reaction to that, some kind of, I'm going to punish the people who push me away, that kind of thing. Any questions about these so far? So these are kind of broad strokes. So I think we'll move on. We've kind of described it a little bit. And I thought it would be interesting to talk just a little bit about the ethics of suicide because Again, I think 
let's just do a little quick pull. Anybody here think that there is something sometimes where someone might commit a rational suicide? Like it may make sense to commit suicide. Who, who, who thinks that's a, a viable scenario? So that it could exist, a situation could exist where it would be a rational thing to do to commit suicide. Okay, so some hands. I would say probably the majority, at least a large minority of people feel that way. That um, there's, there are some circumstances where it just makes sense to kill yourself. And I think that that's the position that Dr. Jenner was taking. You know, like there's really no point here. I'm just, it's time to end it. Um, and so I thought it was interesting. And most physicians, you know, we're, we're not really bioethicists. The, our main job is to take care of people, but we need to have some idea about at making ethical decisions. We're often put in situations where we're the one deciding about big issues in a person's life, sometimes even whether they'll live or die. So there is a kind of well-known um, ethical system in which there are kind of these four, four pillars that physicians are trained in. The first one is respect for autonomy. The next, the next ethical issue is beneficence. We'll talk about all these. The next one is non-maleficence, and the other one is justice. So these are four ethical concepts that come up in lots of ethical scenarios um, in lots of different systems of ethics. There are many more uh, ethical principles, but these four have been consistently identified, taught over and over again in medical schools and so forth to help guide doctors on what to do. And I thought Dr. Jenner was a good one because he's a physician. I thought it would be interesting to do a thought exercise, and we thought about him using his own training as a physician to decide whether or not it would be ethical for him to commit suicide. So the first one is respect for autonomy. So in the context of suicide, it's just this idea that it's my life. I can make the decision with what I want to do with my life, and if I want to end it, then that's my right. That autonomy is that ability um, and that innate property in a person that they should be able to make decisions for themselves. However, in medical decision making, the respect for autonomy is assuming that the person making the decision is, making, is able to make a rational decision. So it, it assumes that they're competent is the legal term, or we, in medicine we use the term capacity, that they have the capacity to make that decision. So classic things would be like a cognitive impairment. You have a brain injury or uh, intellectual disability that might prevent you, right? We, we oftentimes make decisions for people who we feel can't. Um, so in this scenario, in order, in order for him to say, yes, this is ethical, he has to feel that he's in a position, cognitively, maybe emotionally, to actually be able to make the decision. Does that make sense? So I don't know. What, what do people think? This guy, we just saw a four-minute video of him. Does he look like somebody who can make a rational decision right now, that he can weigh all the pros and cons? So the answer was not really, not after no sleep and all that drinking. <laughs> yeah. So he's not, the, the mentioned there's a zombie apocalypse going on. Uh, so does that mean he might be under a little bit of stress? Yeah. Worse than your average Monday. Okay. Any other comments about that? So maybe we have some reason to believe that he doesn't, at least at that point, when he's slamming down the red wine, have the capacity to make this decision for himself. So the next thing is beneficence. So this idea is that when a, a physician does something, it should be to the betterment of the patient. It should promote healing in some way. We shouldn't just do it for the betterment of our pocketbook or whatever to make us feel better. It should have some benefit to the patient. So what might be a benefit to Dr. Jenner if he, by committing suicide? So he'd be relieved of his stress. Not only alone. Okay, so that's interesting. Maybe he'll be he won't be alone, especially if he has maybe religious beliefs that that he's going to join whoever, uh, maybe join the person who gave that sample. If any of you, right? He won't have the experience of being alone anymore, even if he's if he doesn't have those. Any other ones? Right. And so this is an interesting 
issue that it's it's harder to to um, kind of prove because we don't know what's going to happen to him when he dies, right? None of us really know that. So it depends a lot on the perspective of the person considering this. Maybe the person considering this, and, and I run into this in assessing people, believe um, that there is an afterlife, but if I commit suicide, actually it's the opposite. It's not the end. I'm going to go to hell. And that's a lot worse. And that may or may not um, be protective. Some people actually are so, I would say, sick. We'll get into that later because that's my perspective, that they're sick. But um, some people are so sick that they actually believe that and they still do it because they believe they deserve that. Um, but these are all really good kind of points because it gets you into the idea of what could the potential benefit be. Now what's interesting is in, in medicine that benefit usually is somehow promoting health. So it would be kind of hard to argue <laughs> that you're promoting health if you kill yourself. But um, you could, I see how you could make an argument that there could be some relief from suffering, right? And we make those in palliative care at the end of life, we make those decisions. Um, we often give people medicines that we know will actually hasten their death. Um, it will make them die more quickly with the idea that they're, they're going to die reasonably soon anyway and we'd like to alleviate their suffering. So there is a kind of continuum with this stuff, right? Um, the idea of non-maleficence is this idea of First, do no harm. Well, it, killing yourself is <laughs> clearly doing some kind of harm, at least to the cells, if, if not to your soul or your spirit. But if we just sort of suspend that, that's kind of related to the previous topic. If we just say, all right, this is a special case, we'll say that the, um, he's not creating harm because he's relieving suffering. Uh, and that's an argument that's made. One interesting issue, though, is what's the damage of suicide? Is it just to that person? And it really is not. The evidence have shown that it has shown that it's not. Um, it has huge impacts on families, on society. You know, in this case, Dr. Jenner might say, well, my family's gone, um, which might be fair. Um, in, in the real world, um, there's an interesting, I showed you some figures about suicide in the United States the estimated economic burden of suicide is about $34 billion a year, um, which I was kind of looking at. It's pretty steep, actually. That's about $850,000 per suicide. Um, so it's hard to measure the emotional impact. We know that it has a big emotional impact on networks, families, work systems, you know. But uh, that can be hard to measure. So sometimes we appeal to economic measures to see you know, how does this affect things? Uh, so the last one is the idea of justice. Is it fair? In most of medicine, this comes up a lot in like uh, organ transplant. You know, is it fair for this person to incur the risk of giving up their kidney? Is it fair for this person to get the kidney versus that person? You know, how do you make these kind of decisions? So fairness is a, is a big issue there. Um, is it fair to treat somebody with... Uh, uh, an experimental treatment that you don't know exactly how it's going to work. Is that, is that an appropriate risk for someone to take based on their kind of stakes in the game? So in this case, is it fair? Well, you can appeal to different systems like a religious system that's, that says either it is or it isn't, like it's something you can do or you can't. That's one way. It's interesting in this case, is it fair, is it just for him to do this when he's the only known infectious disease doctor in the United States? Is it a fair thing for him to relieve his own suffering and give up on this uh, when he has this special skill set? So is it, is it ethically appropriate? Uh, right, it's a big cost to society, right? Probably more than $850,000. Uh, so now the other, the other thing is, is it fair for us to impose that on him? He's the one who has to live through this suffering, right? So we have something to lose, but is it fair for us to pin that on this one guy? Any other thoughts about these kinds of things? Okay. So I just thought, you know, ethics and law aren't exactly the same. They overlap and they're related. But I thought it would just be interesting to throw some things in. Um, is suicide illegal? Um, it depends on when you ask the question. Uh, earlier in the 20th century, it was actually the norm for states to have laws that made suicide illegal, which meant that if you survived a suicide attempt, you could go to jail. Um, it was a criminal offense. And I see some 
facial expressions out here. Some of you can't see, kind of raised eyebrows. Uh, I think that was the position of the public. You know, some people think it's a just thing to do, it's okay to do. Most people think, you know, probably not, but these are probably people who are suffering, so do we really want to make them suffer more by putting them in jail? I think that, that was the common sentiment. And so over time, those laws changed. And right now, um, I don't know, there may be a few random statutes on the books, uh, but none of them are enforced, and virtually all of them have actually been eliminated. There aren't very many statutes out there, if any at this point, so <clears throat> it's not. Now it is illegal in most states to assist someone in committing suicide, to be a party to their suicide. Um, with the exception of four states where there are medically assisted suicides that are legal. Um, and some of you may be familiar with some of these laws. Um, so now the system is not so much that suicide itself triggers a legal process, but that mental illness with a suicide attempt or a high risk of suicide or actually a homicide as well. We're not talking about that. But basically mental illness that comes with serious risk to self or others. And that does trigger a legal system but not a criminal legal system. It's a mental health legal system. And the way that works, it really varies by state. Looks like that clip got clipped off a little bit. But um, the gist of it is in the United States if you're, if you're giving uh, some person, usually either a, a mental health professional or a physician and or some member of law enforcement that's been called to your home because your family says, you know, my, my brother's going to commit suicide or whatever. Um, certain people in the community are given powers for detaining and they're usually some combination of law enforcement and health care providers uh, for a short period of time for the person to be evaluated for their level of risk. And that does vary a little bit, the mechanics of it, by state and by jurisdiction. But there's enough federal case law that, by and large, that means 72 hours or less, um, pretty much no matter where you are. You're going to be evaluated, and you can be held against your will uh, for about that long. And then it, it gets a little more variable. You have to just basically establish this idea of probable cause to hold somebody. And then it, it kind of varies to your level of how long you can treat somebody, how how aggressive you can get with your treatment. Can you start giving people injections of medicines or can you just hold them in a safe environment? And then how frequently do you have to come back and say, is this person better yet? Can they be let go? You know, can, they, can they be back in charge of their treatment? Any questions on that? I don't know. Unfortunately, I practice in Wisconsin and, I, and we have a, a crazy, crazy mental health legal system. <laughs> no, no pun intended there. Um, it's, it's pretty convoluted, so I, I won't take you through that. Uh, I know that Illinois is more straightforward and is more like most states. Um, so I don't know a lot about the Illinois details. OK. So we're kind of moving on from the ethics and moving on to a medical model. I've already probably shown my cards here. You may have figured it out just by me being introduced as a physician, but even giving you nods that I kind of tend to think of this whole thing as being pathologic, as being not normal, a disease state. Um, while I can uh, entertain the idea of a rational suicide, um, my kind of training and my position is to sort of suspend that idea as something that's a nice thing for ethicists to think about, but most of the time this is a disease. And the reason I say that is, so I I've, I've have this, I like this, um, I, I was going to kind of more traditional sources for a definition, but I actually like this one from bio, Biology Online. Um, a pathologic condition in which the normal functioning of an organism or body is impaired or disrupted, resulting in extreme pain, dysfunction, distress, or death. So that's the idea of a disease. And I would challenge you to argue against the idea that the state of wanting to die, or at least the state of not wanting to live, doesn't fit that idea. Because by definition, if it goes down the road, it results in pain, suffering, death, disease. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a disease. It's going to result in death. It's going to end in the end of the system. It's going to end in no longer, no cells functioning, no propagation, you know, no procreation, that kind of thing. So disease is this idea that the, the set of conditions creates actual 
harm. So uh, one, one kind of way of thinking about this is there used to be, uh, you're, you've probably heard, some, especially in nursing, this idea of what's an STD, a sexually transmitted disease. And that, that nomenclature actually changed recently. So we talk about STIs now, a, a sexually tra transmitted infection, because many of these infections actually aren't diseases. They, they don't cause symptoms or problems. And unfortunately, this is one of the many luxuries afforded to men is that men, <laughs> men typically uh, are often don't have symptoms from infections that women will actually have disease from. So that's just an example um, as a kind of thought exercise that there, just something being abnormal um, that you can identify a condition doesn't necessarily make a disease. And I accept that. And so sometimes maybe fleeting thoughts of, of suicide um, might actually just not be a disease. But if we're getting into the realm of actual desire to die that is persistent, then I, I think it's hard to argue that it's not some kind, of, some kind of disease state. So I've argued that way. So is it, is it its own thing? Is suicidality, which is a term that we use in mental health, that isn't actually a word, but um, we like it, so we use it. So is suicidality itself a disease? And I'll spare you the review um, and I'll talk out of both sides of my mouth. So I've told you that I think it is a disease state, but I have to admit that identifying it as a diagnosis to stand alone on its own has not borne out well in the research. Um, so what is it then? If I'm telling you that it's a disease, but then I can't give you uh, an ICD-10 code for suicidality, um, what is it? So I think it's a symptom. and. And it, it's been pretty well borne out that it's a symptom associated with mental illness and just about all of them. So if you go through the DSM-4, now 5, and you pick just about any disease out of there that causes significant kind of symptoms, the number of folks who commit suicide in those groups as a proportion will be higher than the general population. Um, the most risky one is actually depression and bipolar disorder. Um, but virtually all of these, you know, so all your main players that you, most of you have heard of, major depression, anxiety disorders, um, psychotic disorders like schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder have much higher rates of suicide. And the severity of the disease um, tends to correlate with the risk. So how are we doing on time here? What time do we end? 1.30? Okay. So this is uh, from a very large study, thousands of retrospective uh, chart reviews and it kind of broke down what they saw and I'll save you kind of going through the math because this has come out in several studies um, about 90 to 95 percent of suicides are correlated with either a primary mental illness um, mental illness with some stressor so a chronic mental illness that just never gets better and somebody commits suicide um, a rel relapsing in remitting kind of mental illness with a, a known stressor. Uh, we count alcohol and substance abuse disorders in mental illness. So uh, lots and lots of folks have those. Um, and the, uh, the other issue would be kind of medical illnesses that would cause mood symptoms. So there are a handful of folks that um, maybe 5 or 10% of people could be identified as not necessarily having that making, having some acute stressor outside of any known kind of mental illness or substance abuse or medical illness. Um, so maybe you can talk about that, but 90% of the time you're looking at something that's underlying and potentially, potentially treatable. So I, I've made the argument that if it's part of a, a kind of disease, set, a symptom of several diseases, is it treatable? And we won't get into that. That's really not the focus of the talk. But just to lend evidence to this, all of these treatments, lithium is a medicine, as clozapine, ECT is electroconvulsive therapy, um, and SSRIs are the most common thing, which you, the, the typical antidepressants that you hear about, um, all have evidence that they reduce the risk of suicide. Despite what some of you may have heard about black box warnings on SSRIs, the actual deaths reduce with SSRIs. There is some debate. Um, to the point that the FDA has put a uh, black box warning on the idea of brief increases in suicidal thinking 
that can occur in some folks when they first start taking SSRIs. But when you look at the data, actually continuing on these medicines reduces risk of people dying by their own hand. Um, DBT is a, is a therapy, a, a group therapy for uh, borderline personality disorder, CBT and, and major depression. So these are psychotherapies. Um, all of them have evidence in reducing risk. And there are actually some others too. Um, the one at the bottom there, support, so these are things like reducing risk, just giving some support to people like helplines, those actually have some evidence as well uh, to reduce. These other things have maybe a little more robust evidence. So I made my pitch to you. I think that this really is a heterogeneous group. There are lots of reasons that underlie this, you know, this phenomenon that we see. But in most cases, there are reasons that are primarily, probably, or at least correlated with mental health problems, medical problems that are imminently treatable. So the majority of these things probably aren't uh, kind of rational uh, situation. So in practice, I just kind of want to talk to you about what does this look like for a guy like me who works in this high volume psychiatric emergency room where probably every other patient I see has some element of suicidal thinking, suicide, high suicide risk, um, you know, as, as, uh, as high risk as, you know, I remember a couple weeks ago talking to a patient with uh, the patient's family and being really struck that the parents were sitting with this adult patient, a young adult, probably in the age group that would be around uh, this area, with the sort of purple contusions around his neck from having just attempted to hang himself and, and having these, these kind of conversations about um, mental illness and treatment and so forth. Um, so it gets that acute to just somebody having being feeling down and having kind of flashes of maybe maybe it would be better to be dead. So it's a huge spectrum. Um, so the first thing that I want to say, and probably the only thing, especially for the folks to hear from nursing and people thinking of going into psychology, um, this has been shown a million bajillion times. Asking people about suicidality does not increase the risk of them committing suicide. So that's point one. And that's something I remind myself every day. It's uncomfortable sometimes to talk about it. It makes the person who is asking feel, you know, a burden on them. It's, it can be a drag, and it can make you feel responsible for somebody's life. But at the end of the day, it's just part of the job. You've got to ask if you're in this field. Um, and that's the starting point. From there, you want to get an idea for, of the intensity of it. How often does this happen? How close have they come? Is this something that is going to happen, like, right now if they walk out the door? Or is it something that has come across their mind and is bothersome, but they really are convinced, no, I'm, I'm not going to do this, but I just have these kind of flashes of thoughts uh, or notions. And then if you, if you get a beat on this and, and I, I think somebody has some risk, then I want to get an idea for what's the psychological implication of this. What, what are they trying to get out of this? Is it a relief from suffering like we talked about before? Is it um, an inward aggression? I deserve to die. Um, some kind of, you know, people get very, very guilty about things, and they think this is the only way. They've shamed their family. That's a common thing. Um, sometimes it's an outward aggression. Those tend to be a little more impulsive, uh, but we, we do see that. People get very angry, and instead of trying to kill somebody else, they just say, oh, they're going to have to live with this, with me, you know. And typically that kind of thing will pass. Um, and people will think better of it, but it can happen in the kind of heat of the moment. Um, and then there's this other thing, you know, there are all kinds of ways to slice this, but we do see fairly commonly psychosis where the suicide is kind of part of a, a delusion, an idea that, um, you know, for instance, in order to save the rest of humanity, I have to kill myself, you know, uh, to prevent the coming of the Antichrist or that kind of thing. And that's not real common, but it is fairly dangerous, and we see it a, a fair amount in a, in a setting where you treat really high acuity mental illness. Okay, so he, this isn't a quiz. There's no right or wrong answer. I'd just like to hear people tell me what they think risk factors for suicide are. Can you just shout them out? So what would be risky? Somebody already mentioned, so we've got a couple gimmies already. Somebody mentioned that he's drinking in there, right? So uh, alcohol is a major risk. 
yeah, call it out. Mental illness? Terminal illness? Guns? Loss of a loved one? These are all correct so far. Yeah, so I would, I would put that in two broader categories. I would, I would consider that a risk. Um, one is loss, just of anything really important. Could be a relationship, could be um, you know, a, a physical ability. Um, and the other one is just uh, kind of trauma. You know, that's a pretty traumatic kind of experience. What else? Rejection? I'm sorry? Rejection. Rejection, yeah. Um, any kind of isolation feeling onto yourself. Abuse, trauma of any kind, but especially abuse. And abuse uh, that's systematic is particularly risky because there's trauma, and then there's this kind of helplessness. People get trapped. Um, so these are good, good suggestions here, and you've covered a lot of these. And the biggest one is previous attempts, and that's just a general trend in, in kind of predicting behavior. If somebody's done it before, they're much more likely to do it again, and that's true with suicide. Um, men are, we talked about before, more likely to complete young people and older people. And so somebody mentioned terminal illness. Um, it's interesting, like cancer diagnosis itself isn't in and of itself a risk you know, for depression, like major depression. Um, there can be mood problems that come from medical illnesses, and there's a slightly higher risk of suicide, but the age in general, just people as they get into their elderly years commit suicide at fairly high rates. And we do, sometimes we don't think about that. I think we tend to think more of the tragedy of a young person dying, but uh, elderly people have high rates of suicide. Um, access to firearms was mentioned. Helpless, hopeless, and trapped. Those are huge. Those are things that I'm always looking for. And to me, psychologically, those are the really important things. Um, if somebody feels relatively empowered and they just have a kind of, uh, what is one of my patients talks about, stinking thinking. Like they just have this place where they go back with their mind, right? That they have a pattern of thinking about suicide, but in actuality, they're fairly empowered. They have resources. I tend to worry about them not so much, even if they have quite a bit. And I do have patients that I see regularly that think about suicide quite a lot, but they're, I would categorize them as kind of low to moderate long-term risk and not a high risk where I've got to put them in the hospital right now. Um, but the people who are the opposite, who feel helpless, hopeless, there's just no way Actually, uh, intellectual impairment is, is a risk factor in and of itself. Aero is alcohol and other drugs of abuse. So any of these things, all the stuff we like to do that makes us the life of the party, uh, makes us more likely, uh, alcohol is especially bad. Uh, and it, particularly acute intoxication. So some studies have shown as many as 70% of people post-mortem that have committed suicide in their autopsy, there was some kind of intoxicant in their system. So it's very common. Not necessarily abuse, but just being acutely intoxicated when you're feeling suicidal. Um, there are a few of these. Uh, this is kind of interesting. Like, just a history of aggression in general puts people at risk. So something about acting on these feelings in an aggressive way incurs some risk. So in order to do it, you've got to think about it. And in order for it to be really risky, you, you have to kind of mean it. Being alone, being isolated, big time loss, um, recent discharge is uh, from a hospital is a big risk factor. So people, when they first come out of psychiatric admissions, are really at risk. And uh, mental illness in general, which we mentioned. So in practice, what do you do then? There's this, this whole spectrum of risk from uh, very, very rarely does somebody like me, a psychiatrist, see somebody coming into a psychiatric ER with zero risk, right? When, when we look at that, it's, it's pretty easy to pick up a couple risk factors for somebody who's just kind of under stress. Um, but clearly I'm not admitting every person I see to the hospital, certainly not involuntarily. Um, so the one extreme end of the spectrum is somebody who has just no clue, maybe go back to that extreme of the delusion, right? They, they really have no insight, they're at super high risk, and they're not willing to get treatment. That, that person, I'm going to use that legal system that I talked about, I'm going to admit them to the hospital, I'm probably going to get a, a, judge, a judge to give me a court order to actually administer medicine up to them via an injection to get them well enough to realize, and, and this really does happen most of the time, like, oh, thanks, doc, feeling better. You know, it doesn't mean that everything is sunshine and roses, but most of the time they're not in that acute crisis where they're actually going to kill themselves. And then the other end of the spectrum is somebody who just has, like I said, a notion, 
um, they've just they just ran into their ex boyfriend, and it caused a big stir. They thought they were over it, and they need to call something like a warm line. Warm line is probably the the lowest end of the spectrum as far as an intervention for a brief feeling. We're just talking to somebody else, and a warm line is different than a hotline in that it's probably like a peer. Um, it's not meant to be for real acute risk. Uh, it's meant to be just for a little support so you kind of don't go down that road. Um, the next thing would be a hotline, which is more of a triage situation where somebody's talking to you on the phone to try to help you figure out how much help you need. But it's not actually physically with a provider. Um, and then it, you, know, you just kind of go through. Sometimes um, that support thing is just necessary from someone in the room, someone who's trained, a psychologist, a counselor, a social worker, a psychiatrist, primary care doctor, somebody that can work through this problem and make a plan with somebody, but they can still just, they can go home, they can be with them, their family. And then we kind of covered, there's everything in between. Um, there are partial hospitalization programs where you don't stay in the hospital overnight, but you do kind of all the programming that you would do in an inpatient hospitalization. So there's a big spectrum. So I thought it would be interesting to go back to Dr. Jenner and see where he came in on our hit list. Um, so here are the risk factors that I see for him. He's isolated. Insomnia, uh, in addition to being part of lots of mental illnesses, is an independent risk factor for suicide. Um, so being sleep deprived is risky. Guilt and shame are really common. Those have been shown. I didn't put that last slide wasn't everything. There are probably more than 100 risk factors that have been scientifically validated. So I've added some other ones here. Um, loss. So some of you may know that, I won't do too much of a spoiler, but some of you may know that that brain sample that he sacrificed accidentally, Dr. Jenner actually had a personal, he knew that person very well. Um, so there was a lot of loss. He lost his work and he lost someone dear to him. Um, he seemed to have a depressed mood to me. That's a little stretch. He didn't tell me that. Uh, he's talking about it, he's thinking about it, and he has a very highly lethal means. Physicians are actually at higher risk uh, just by being docs. And I would say that's uh, an interesting phenomenon. People in the military also at very high risk. People who are familiar with death, um, you might think, oh, they've seen all the suffering. You know, psychiatrists are actually higher than average physicians for uh, risk of suicide. And, and I've seen just how awful suicide just tears families apart. And basically every psychiatrist has. But there's something interesting that seems to happen when people are exposed to death in a very present way. Um, if they're kind of immersed in a culture of death, like the military, where it's sort of embraced, like, you know, the flying skull battalion of wherever, um, you know, then something seems to shift. It, it, it's a little easier for them to go to these places. Um, so a physician, him being a doctor in and of itself was a risk factor. He was drinking. He's isolated, and he felt pretty darn hopeless. So I wouldn't let Dr. Jenner leave my ER. Dr. Jenner would have stayed with me if I could have got a hold of him and see if I could help him. And if not, eventually the court would let him go, and he'd have to make his decision on his own. But hopefully he wouldn't be drunk when he left. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing my job very well. <clears throat> so just thanks to Troy for having me. And uh, Tony Thrasher runs the Psychiatric Crisis Service. He helped me out, gave me a couple of these slides, actually. Um, he's, a, he's a great guy. If anybody, if any of you nurses end up in Milwaukee, he'd be a great guy to work with. Um, you can't read any of this. These are some good references. Uh, if anybody, seriously, you can email uh, if you want any of these, you know, the literature kind of stuff. The um, charts and a lot of the really good broad information I got directly from the CDC. They have a lot of information. You don't have to be a provider to get to it. You just need uh, you know, a web browser. So if you're interested, the CDC is a really good resource. Um, they have a, a violence prevention in a specific suicide area that has lots. And they have all the data. So there are lots of other organizations that are uh, designed to try to reduce suicide. Um, but most of the data actually comes from the CDC. So I accept questions on suicide mental health issues, psychiatry, talk people into coming into psychiatry, we need more, um, guitars and bikes. So, <laughs> those, do we have any questions? And we have about 10 minutes. I have a uh, microphone, so raise your hand and I can bring it so everyone can hear. So, how about a quick round of applause before your question? 
Okay, we starting off here in the back. Hi there. So Hi. I'm Linda, one of the counselors, and I'd like to clarify something. So obviously suicide needs to be taken very seriously. However, I would say having suicidal thoughts is probably very, very common. Mm -hmm. Probably the majority of people at some point have had suicidal thoughts. That we've had, you know, deep sadness. Life is just full of, you know, unfortunately, some very serious exper you know, experiences that we have. So, yes, it's serious. But if for at any reason you or some friends are having suicidal thoughts, you know, just know that, that it's great to talk about some of these things with people, whether the counseling center, friends, you know, parents, and just, you know, nip it in the bud, so to speak. So it's um, a lot more common that you think. Didn't want to just pass yeah. it, you know, I would apologize. Just, I would just e echo that. Uh, and I tried to give you some glimpse of that and that this idea of a spectrum, right? Even people who are coming for help, the majority of them don't need really big interventions. Sometimes you just need to talk about it. And um, virtually everybody has had some thought of this from just a kind of, I wonder, a curiosity. I wonder what that would be like or just have their mind go there to a passing thought. So it is, it's very common. Um, what you want to look for is how intense is that, how frequent is it? in yourself or if you hear a friend talking about it. That's a really good point. I was just wondering um, what percentage of people that you see that come in for crisis mm -hmm. would end up medicated? What'd you say? I don't, I don't have data, so I can just tell you the, my kind of feel. Um, I, the place that I work is really skewed. Um, it is a county, it's, everybody who is detained by the police in Milwaukee County have to be seen by somebody employed, a psychiatrist employed by the county. So it's a skewed group, um, by and large sicker than even the average psychiatrist sees. Real, real sick actually. Um, and I, in my training I work on the inpatient units that we admit to there, which are the uninsured kind of um, indigent care, and you know at any given point um, you know, 75%, 80% of my patients on an inpatient unit would be major mental illness with psychosis, which is unheard of. You know, that's like 5 or 10% of inpatient units. That's like 1 or 2% of the entire population. So I, I just want to preface by saying that it's a skewed group that I see. So th the majority, if somebody doesn't have a mental health uh, history, so what we, we don't, I showed you those medicines and some of the other non-medicine interventions, but we tend to not treat just the feeling of, I want to commit suicide. We, we want to cut to why, what's going on here, and then pick the treatment that matches whatever underlying mental health issue there is. So we, we use the behavior of attempting or, or the threats to get somebody screened but then when, once the screening is done and the risk assessment is made, you know, then we want to get at what's, what's going on underneath this. Does that, does that answer that? So a, lar a large proportion of people I see, um, but not b because a large proportion of the people I see actually have mental illness. Um, if somebody is doing their job right, they don't just jump to medicine. And the fact is that while these medicines are effective in reducing these risks, they aren't acutely effective. So if I give some, some, somebody, you know, fluoxetine, Prozac, the most common SSRI, it's not like that's going to work right now. That's, gonna, that's likely to work with support over time. So um, does, that, does that help? All right. I was just going to say, too, we talk a lot in nursing about um, there isn't a medication for suicide. So mm -hmm. what the medication would be is really if there's an untreated mental illness right. going on and then exactly as you said then that is a timely process to figure out what is the right illness and what would be the right treatment and mm -hmm. those treatments aren't quickly effective so um, the like Linda was saying the talking is so important when we see patients that are suicidal because that's much more um, direct and immediate way of evaluating and creating some support for them and meds might come in, you know, much later. And, and you know what I would say is that um, that's that's a really good point. I appreciate that. 
Um, there are scenarios in which I can imagine giving somebody a medicine is actually a risk factor for suicide beyond what I was telling you, this suicidal ideation and SSRIs, um, in that if somebody is feeling helpless, hopeless, and you cram something down their throat, it doesn't help them feel too empowered. So what, as a psychiatrist, you know, somebody who's on this kind of border of you know, being a medical doctor but then having a psychological perspective, um, a good one is always thinking about that, the psychological implications of prescribing a medicine. And that's probably beyond the, the scope of this kind of general talk. But it's, it's just something to think about. Um, and, and it's an interesting part of my job. You know, the, the most effective treatment is the one that, um, that the patient actually feels part of in, in most of the time. Uh, I came in late for the discussion, so excuse mm -hmm. me if you've addressed this. I've read a lot of some literature on suicide and relating things and mm -hmm. like the language of it. And I read something, it was very convincing, like how it's important to not refer to like dying by suicide as like committing suicide or like non-lethal attempts as failed attempts or right. success or um, lethal is successful. Mm -hmm. uh, just because the way it frames it in the person's mind, um, it can make it sound like a crime when it's really more of a tragedy, just the cause of a death. And right. it's certainly not a good thing if someone attempts suicide and then they die by it. So I just... Well, I wanted to know your opinion on the language. I agree. It. I, I sometimes slipped in because these, um, in our culture, a lot of these, you know, these terms are used. Um, so they'll even come out of me sometimes. But I tend to agree with that. Um, and, and I actually would go a step further in clinically when I'm actually, in a talk like this, we need to have some common terms. And we're talking a little more intellectually about this. But when I'm working with patients, I tend to not even use the word suicide at all. I talk about dying. And do you, you know your desire to die, your desire to live, and and hopefully something tailored to the patient. Um, if they've made a connection with me and shared with me, uh, if there's a plan or the kinds of thoughts that they have, using their language as much as possible on a one-to-one -one level. But in a in a broader sense, I think that's right. That um, we should try to to think about somebody being in that state as a really um, if you try to be empathetic, how awful that has to feel. And, and if l luckily they survive you know, um, an attempted suicide, uh, uh, a big act, then that really is a great thing. You know? Hi, uh, I also actually uh, came here very, very late. <laughs> Sorry, okay. I missed it. Um, my question is, is there an absolute way to uh, prevent the dispersing of drugs to these people, um, maybe after they attempted the first time a suicide. Um, meaning, we all know basically there are so many side effects to um, antipsychotics. Um, my question basically uh, pertains to the uh, holistic aspect of, of not falling in that, you know, that level again. Okay. Without the drugs. Are you mean? Um, are you referring to someone who maybe has uh, attempted suicide by overdose? Perhaps. Or perhaps. I'm, uh, again, I'm not very knowledgeable in this, but yeah. Okay. Um, so there are a couple issues there. Um, one that didn't come up before. So that is that is an issue and kind of the practice part of this talk that we're we we're saying. You know, um, you you treat mental illness with medicines, but we saw that the second most common way to die by suicide is by over by poisoning and and within poisoning it's, it's usually prescription medicines so there's a risk there um, the risk it's interesting that you mentioned antipsychotics because antidepressants actually used to be a lot more risky um, up until about the 1980s the SSRIs um, a lot of people don't know this these newer medicines since the 1990s aren't really actually that much more effective and usually they're about the same as the medicines from the 1970s, in terms of their efficacy, they're just a heck of a lot safer and easier to use. So that's why everybody gets these things, and we don't use these older, cheaper medicines because those medicines um, are, can be really lethal. So you have to be very careful. Um, antipsychotics can be, um, and we won't get, I mean, I'm sorry if people don't know what these different things are, it's just the scope, but um, there are, let's say there are more, more and less dangerous medi medications in uh, treating mental illness. And the first step is deciding if a medication is even indicated, because people can be treated with psychotherapy alone, and sometimes that's really appropriate. 
Um, the second thing is which one and as few as possible. You know, and that is something um, that really falls mostly on physicians, but does fall somewhat on us as patients and society to say everything isn't going to be fixed with a pill. There isn't a pill for every single thing. Um, we just want to make this cost benefit thing work as best we can. Um, so, you know, we think about that. Um, my, my grandma just passed away, and, um, you know, we were dealing, she was in her, in, her, in her 90s, and for the past 10 years, been dealing with managing that medication list, you know, trying to keep, keep it cold down as much as possible so you aren't just throwing more risk at somebody without much more benefit. So that becomes particularly important in, in a group that's at risk for overdose. Does that, does that help? Okay. Okay, I, with that, I think we're out of time. How about one more round of applause and thank you to Dr. Burns. We will be um, hanging out a little bit here afterwards, so if you have questions, please come up and ask. I want to remind you again, our counselors are in the back. Thank you both for coming. And if you or your friends ever need to you know, have these conversations, um, our counseling department is absolutely excellent, and um, you know, please feel free to reach out to them. And uh, thank you again for coming. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. These numbers are up here, too, if there's somebody you want to give them a number you're worried about, that kind of thing.